Hello, everybody. This is Dr. Darshan Shah, the host of the Next Health Forefront podcast. And today I'm very excited to have a virologist on the Next Health Forefront podcast. And of course, the reason why we have a virologist is so we can learn about viruses. She's a true expert in viruses and everything having to do with research around vaccines and how we're going to get through this current pandemic. Um, I know we've heard from doctors, we've heard from public health officials, but I haven't yet interviewed someone who's deep in the science of viruses and the vaccine, and this is why I reached out to Morgan Frenny. Morgan Frenny is currently at the University of Queensland working in a laboratory that is creating vaccines. So she's the perfect person to talk to about this current pandemic and just viruses in general. She's currently pursuing her PhD in molecular virology. Back in 2017, when she first started working with viruses, she joined this RNA virology lab and was designing and testing actually an Ebola vaccine. She graduated and then she continued work for two more years as a research assistant at the University of Queensland, working on RNA viruses and studying how they cause diseases and developing vaccines to fight diseases. And what's really incredible is now she's working on a very special project, which is developing a vaccine that can fight multiple viruses at the same time. Now, that would be a game changer, and it could be coming to us from outside of Australia, and I can't wait to talk to her about that. Sounds very interesting. She's passionate also, on top of doing all this incredible scientific work, she's passionate about communicating to the general public about the reality about viruses from a scientific level. And in fact, she has a great way of communicating this, and you can read some of her posts and listen to her on her Instagram page, Virus versus Lab Coat, which is how I selected her to be the one to join our podcast. She just has a great way about her. She knows how to educate people and really bring the science down to an understandable level. So I'm happy to welcome Morgan Frenny to the podcast, and I can't wait to hear what she has to say about viruses and coronavirus in particular. Okay. All right, Morgan. Is it okay to call you Morgan? Yeah, of course. <laughs> oh, fantastic. So Morgan, thank you so much for doing this today. Um, I have a ton of questions for you, and I've also asked some of our clients, some of our patients, what questions they have, because you know it's not often that we get to talk to a virologist, and especially someone who is like you that's willing to share your knowledge and make it understandable to us. So thanks for doing this. Oh, I'm so excited to hear all the questions. <laughs> yeah, so I, later on, I do want to talk to you about what you're currently doing in your lab, because it just sounds incredibly interesting and exactly on point for what everyone needs to know right now when I talk about vaccines and stuff like that. But how long have you um, been in the lab for now? Uh, I think about four years. So I'm 25 now, and I was pursuing my Bachelor of Biotechnology starting when I was 20. Mm -hmm. So I was that. I think I was in the lab when I was about 21 years of age. I started like an introduction to research course because, yeah, I just couldn't see myself getting a job without doing research and science and especially biotechnology. It's very, the whole point is that it's translatable. So, you know, I was really interested in infectious diseases because at that time, I think the Ebola outbreak was occurring. And then after that, we had the Zika outbreak. That really drove my passion for viruses in particular. So right. yeah, I got into a RNA virology lab because these are all RNA viruses. And I just basically learned all the different skills you need to be a scientist and how to test different experiments and work with viruses to study how they cause disease and um, how to induce mutations that you can study and see you know, how that those mutations could potentially contribute to transmission of that virus and disease pathogenesis, which is the ability to cause disease. Yeah. So yeah, I did that course. And after that, I was really excited because I kind of found like a bit of a passion there. You know, I felt um, really competent in my skills. Like they were growing and I was making a lot of mistakes, but I was learning from those mistakes and feeling like I'd found my niche that worked for me. So after that, I did my um, honors, which is just a full year of research. And during that, I worked on an Ebola vaccine. So that was so amazing. Like that vaccine didn't work, but um, just to be able to feel like I was doing something because, you know, all these people were dying, especially women and children in Africa. 
And I felt like that was driving my passion and my motivation to continue that research. So yeah, I was working on the Ebola vaccine. And after that, I decided that I kind of didn't feel ready to do my PhD yet. I wanted to get a little bit more experience. So I did a two year stint just as a research assistant, um, yeah, studying different viruses. So the viruses I study are flubby viruses. So you may have heard of yellow fever, dengue yeah. in the US, West Nile virus. And these are all viruses that are transmitted by insects. In this case, mosquitoes. So a bit different from coronaviruses, but quite similar in that they're an RNA virus. Um, yeah, so I worked on all those different viruses and made a West Nile virus vaccine and wow. put that in crocodiles. And I was working on a Zika vaccine as well. And yeah, after I completed that those two years, I thought I was pretty much ready to start my PhD. <laughs> That's amazing. You're so young and you're getting a PhD in molecular virology and you're working on all working on vaccines. Like, are you ever scared of being in the lab around all these viruses? Is it, is it ever scary of you getting an infection mm -hmm. or something? Not yet. So we have like different classes and different levels of containment. So the level of containment that I work in is called PC2 or BSL level 2. And most of those viruses, if you were to be infected, they wouldn't kill you. So most of those viruses, they're usually called mild disease, like flu-like symptoms. So I'm not that scared, but we work with the viruses in this like hood. So it yep. has like a screen and a laminar flow that prevents stuff from getting out and stuff from getting in. Yeah, I saw your pictures on Instagram and you're in full gear and behind the hood. <laughs> it's not really full gear. If I was to go up to like a high containment facility, the one that like um, the coronaviruses are worked with in, it's like, yeah, full body suit and like separate airflow, negative air pressure facility. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> but I'm hoping to get my access to that soon so I can start working with like more deadly pathogens. You want to work with more deadly path pathogens? Yeah, it's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's amazing. Like that's the thing that is so cool about viruses is they're like these little tiny bits of genetic material with a protein coat and yet they're capable of so much damage and causing so much fear. And yeah, that's what stems my passion is because I want to kind of contribute to the fight against those viruses. Yeah. And maybe eventually you can have a world without infectious disease. That'd be amazing. Wow. Yeah, that, that's an amazing dream. Well, thank God for people like you that are in the lab at such a young age and getting getting the knowledge and the experience to develop these things. It's pretty it's pretty amazing. I know I know the uh, person working on the vaccine in the United States at the CDC is also a young uh, woman just like yourself and um, is just so awesome to see people that are willing to take a risk with their lives to help everyone else in the world and they have a passion around it. Yeah, I don't really feel like I'm taking a risk. It's just I get to do what I'm interested in. I get to do what I love. Like, this is my niche, I feel. And yeah, I'm very lucky to be early on in my career and have kind of found what I feel like I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Well, I hope so at least. No, yeah. Very so, good. Yeah, I just started my PhD at this start of this year, actually. And my project is quite um, a lot to handle, I would say. So usually we have like one vaccine against a single virus or one therapeutic, which is a drug against a single virus. Um, and if we had a vaccine against multiple viruses, that would be much better because if we have all these viruses that are emerging and we're not aware of them, but they have similarity to other viruses, right? So the current virus, SARS-CoV-2, that causes COVID-19, that's related to an original, the original SARS virus, which we call SARS-CoV-1. So if we had had a vaccine against SARS-CoV-1, that could possibly provide protection against SARS-CoV-2, and we wouldn't be in the situation we're in now. So my project is looking at these flaviviruses related to West Nile virus, Japanese encephalitis virus, and seeing if I can develop and design a vaccine that will protect us against like multiple viruses up to like, I think it's like 15 viruses on that now. Wow. So it's a big project. Um, basically I'm doing this by studying the structure of the virus. So I'm looking at regions that are conserved evolutionary so those that don't change because they have an important function and they're kind of going to be the target of my vaccine and my therapeutic. Because if these viruses are all similarly related, they should have areas that are conserved 
that can be a target for that. Got it, got it. Okay, so I want to dive a little bit deeper into that, but let's take it a couple steps back first. So viruses, like you said, I mean, they're, they're amazing. They're just a protein coat around a tiny little piece of RNA, the ones that we're talking about right now, coronavirus, and, and a lot of viruses. So how is this different than like a bacteria or a fungus? Um, can, can you tell us from your perspective, like what makes a virus a virus versus everything else? Yeah, so the question is not what is a virus and how is it different to a bacteria? Because a bacteria is a cell. So how is a virus different from a cell? So, you know, some viruses do have membranes around them and they actually get them from cells. When they're replicating within a cell and performing their lifestyle, they can pick up some of the envelope on the way out mm. of that, the membrane, and that's part of the virus as well. So that's not the difference. The difference is that viruses are not alive. We don't describe them as being alive because they're not able to perform their function on their own. They're not able to generate energy they're not able to metabolize nutrients on their own. They must parasitize a cell and utilize its um, machinery and its function to actually reproduce. So a cell, you know, they have all different organelles that perform many different functions and enable the cell to grow and live. Um, and especially producing energy and metabolize, metabolizing. They have a metabolism, yeah, basically that's the difference. Got it. Um, yeah. so we describe that as life and then viruses they're dead they're not alive but they kind of border on the spectrum of life i guess right right they're like, kind of like nature's little machine almost they're not alive yeah. just a machine that use mm -hmm. your body or your cells or any cell really to just replicate themselves yeah. we call them like um obligate intracellular parasites so Got it. I describe them, I kind of use this metaphor that they're a nano machine. Yeah. So they have the hardware and then they have the software inside, which is the genome or the genetic material. And then they also have a toolkit. So the toolkit is like a repertoire of weapons. Mm. So the toolkit is what we call proteins and they provide the hardware, but they also provide the function. So they bind cells and enter cells with their hardware, with their toolkit. And then they also do a lot of damage that is a direct effect of the toolkit doing that damage and also indirectly by um, redirecting the immune response against us, essentially. So that's how they cause diseases. Yeah. Uh, direct replication, which is their life cycle, and then also indirect damage caused by um, affecting the rest of the body and the immune system. Right, like coronavirus. I mean, one of the biggest problems with this virus is it causes like an overstimulation of our immune system, yeah. especially in our lungs. And that, that overstimulation is what causes um, the intense inflammatory reaction. And, yeah. and like, so, so why do these things exist in nature? Like, what, what is the purpose of these things in nature? You yeah, see that's everything the thing. Like, right? Yeah, these viruses, like, I don't really look at them as pathogens. Like I study them as pathogens. That is something that causes disease, but really evolutionary, they are so important. Like we wouldn't exist as humans if we didn't have viruses. And the reason being is that viruses, they are nature's inventor of genes. So they're constantly mutating. They're constantly coming up with new ideas, new inventions. And those inventions are critical for us to survive and other animals to survive. Like we wouldn't have evolved from laying eggs to giving birth if we didn't have viruses because um, one of the genes that forms the placenta is from a virus. In fact, like 5% of our entire genome is from viruses that have managed to get into our genome and stay there. So that's how I think of viruses. They're incredibly essential for life itself. Wow. So the little machines that are essential for life and we evolved because of them over history and the, yeah. since the beginning of time, but sometimes they end up well, doing bad things. And I think that's an indirect effect. I don't think the, the primary purpose is to just spread and like, you know, come up with new genes, mm. new, um, yeah, like a fountain of genes, basically something that uh, enables evolution to occur. But the ability to cause damage, to cause disease, is just, it's a side effect. It's not really their main purpose. Wow. Wow. I never thought of it that way. That's, 
that's an incredible explanation. It's almost like, you know, if you believe in a God, it's God's way of experimenting with new genes in, in the species. And sometimes it goes well, sometimes it doesn't, but they're just, it's just massive experiments that are happening throughout all of nature. Yeah, it's yeah, amazing. And that's why like, I personally chose to work on viruses, not because of, you know, well, in addition to the fact that they are so fearsome, it's also that we can manipulate them with biotechnology to our advantage. You know, we can, bacteriophages are a type of virus and they can be used to fight bacterial infections. So or, those are viruses that attack bacteria, right? The bacteriophages? Specific to bacteria, yeah. And then we have other viruses that, you know, have tropism, which means they replicate in a certain subset of cells and they can kill those cells specifically. So we can look at something like Zika virus, which primarily targets the brain and we can target brain tumors with Zika virus. Wow. And then also, of course, we can make vaccines from viruses themselves to fight viruses. Right, right. That's, that's incredible. So how are, like, I know there are different families of virus, obviously, right? And so I have this conversation a lot with my patients. They say, well, how is this different than the common cold? And I say, well, the common cold is really just a colloquialism for a, a few different kind of viruses, like the influenza virus, rhinovirus, coronavirus. Can you explain the differences between different viruses and, and um, like structurally, biochemically, how they're different? Yeah, so it goes back to the repertoire of weapons that I talked about. Uh, so some viruses just don't contain the weapons necessary to cause disease. Like without getting too technical, I think it's just based on those proteins. Um, and some proteins antagonize the immune system and cause excessive inflammation, whereas others just harmlessly replicate and that causes a little bit of irritation in the throat, which results in a sore throat and a cough and head flu symptoms, you know? So it really depends on what protein that virus contains that can cause disease. Some are very toxic. Some of these proteins are very toxic and have different abilities to cause disease. So yeah, without getting too technical, it's basically just right. that repertoire of proteins that the genome can encode for. Got it, got it. So in each virus has, of course, a different genome that is coding for different proteins. Yeah. And that's why they end up having different names to them, of course. Yeah. But even within coronavirus, there's seven different coronavirus strains that we know mm -hmm. of. Is that correct? Yeah. And what makes them all different from each other? The I think there's a lot of different strains, actually, in animals and things like that. Wow. So I guess what makes them different is that repertoire and also where it replicates. So we call it like tissue tropism. So mm -hmm. some viruses replicate in the upper respiratory tract and some viruses are able to get down into the lower respiratory tract because these are respiratory viruses. So with SARS and MERS, they cause really severe disease, more severe than SARS-CoV-2. And that's because they get right down into the lower respiratory tract and they cause inflammation and tissue damage and disease there. So that's a much more severe disease than if it was just in the upper respiratory tract, replicating in the nose, in the throat, and you just suffer sore throat, cough, those kind of things, runny nose. Yeah, yeah. so I think it's about where it replicates. And then you have some viruses, like the viruses I work on, where they get into the brain and they cause encephalitis. So that's quite severe. Yeah. And then you have other viruses like Ebola virus that are even more lethal because basically they replicate everywhere. <laughs> Oh. And they're not respiratory, they're in all the different organs, causing damage in all these different organs. Um, yeah. And is, it, is it the reason they replicate in different places because of the um, binding proteins that they bind to in these different cells? Like I Absolutely. know coronavirus is, ACE, is the ACE2 receptor. Yeah, could you explain that to us, Morgan? Yeah, yeah, it's just the ACE2 receptor. What is it called? The angiotensin converting 2 receptor. So that is expressed in so many different organs of the body, um, in the liver, in, I think in the heart, in the brain, in the throat, in the lower respiratory tract, the upper respiratory tract. Yeah. So the potential is there for it to spread to those places. But usually in the majority of cases, we just have it getting in through the nose, replicating in the throat, and then maybe it will move down into the lower respiratory tract, the lower airways into the lungs and cause pneumonia in the severe cases. 
Got it. Got it. Okay. So um, we're talking about coronavirus and I've seen pictures of the coronavirus. It's called coronavirus, of course, because it looks like a crown and it's kind of like this ball with a bunch of little spikes sticking out of it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we're doing um, some research on testing for coronavirus. And in my research, I found it has four different proteins on it. Is that, mm -hmm. is that all the proteins that are, that make up the coronavirus, uh, the different spike spikes. protein, which is the one that causes, like, looks like the crown, the corona, and then there's an envelope protein and a membrane protein, and then what's the other one? Nuclear um, protein. There's a nucleocapsid. The membrane protein is the membrane and the envelope form the structure as well. Right. And then inside that you have a nucleocapsid. So the right. nucleocapsid is what protects the genome and wraps around the genome. Got it. And I think you have a lot of other different little proteins, but um, some of them are involved in like protease activity. So when a virus gets into a cell, it uncoats that outer shell and it delivers a nucleocapsid with the genome. Oh. So when we have that genome, we want to read it and then we want to translate it. And that's how you get protein. So when the virus does this, it produces what we call a polyprotein which is a long string of different proteins and that needs to be cleaved up. So there's proteases, which are little enzymes that cleave up the polyprotein. And then we also have a few other proteins that enable um, reading and writing of that genome and translating that into protein. So there's a few different, you know, there's also, we always say there's like structural proteins that form the structure and then there's non-structural proteins that are essential for replication of the virus and the life cycle and producing the protein from the genome to make more viruses. Got so it. when that's, that's cleaved up, basically those proteins, they form the structure again. It's basically like a production line, a manufacturing facility for viruses. That's what the cell becomes. Mm. And then you have all these proteins assembling into new viral particles and the new genome being um, encapsulated within that viral particle. And then that so will bud from the cell. Got it. Oh, so that's the whole life cycle of this thing. So it attaches via this ACE2 receptor, it gets into the cell, it lets go of its viral RNA, which then gets decoded into more proteins, and then it yeah. assembles itself and gets out of the cell as more viruses. Yeah, more proteins and also more genome, because it wants the genome to be encapsulated within that. Yeah, right. so then it goes into infect neighboring cells, and you just get all these cells producing more and more viruses hundreds of thousands, millions of viruses, and they go on to different cells and cause more damage. Wow. And um, when, you, when you look at this particular coronavirus, COVID-19, how does this one, like how come coronaviruses, some of them are super deadly, like SARS was and MERS, and this one is um, not as deadly, like, you know, as far as once you get the disease, but it yeah. seems to be spreading a lot more rapidly than SARS or MERS did. Why is there a difference between those? So that's the thing, we don't really know this. I do have an opinion and that opinion is that I think this virus has different tissue tropism. So I'll repeat again, like that means it's got ACE2 receptors in different cells in the upper respiratory tract. And so I think it might be replicating in the salivary glands, in the throat, in the nose. And so it's more transmissible because you're sneezing, you are touching saliva, you're putting that everywhere, you're coughing, and then there's like higher viral loads in those regions of your face. So basically, there's more potential for you to spread more virus. Whereas if that's in the case of SARS-CoV-1, which is the original virus, and this is SARS-CoV-2, which causes COVID-19, that original virus seemed to be, or had a preference for the cell receptors in the lower respiratory tract. So it's more likely to cause pneumonia, because it's damaging those cells, it's replicating in the alveolar of the lungs, and it's filling those with liquid, and that's what you get in pneumonia. So I uh, think, yeah. Yeah, it's so, so it's, mainly in, it's mainly in the upper respiratory tract and dividing, and there's a huge amount of viruses there, and it's mm -hmm. easy to cough and sneeze out onto yeah. other people. And also, just being asymptomatic, I think, in most oh, people, yeah. right? That yeah. the, because I think, you know, maybe it's replicating up here and that's easier for the immune system to clear that virus out and get rid of it. So, or maybe it just doesn't replicate enough to cause severe disease up here. And so majority of cases are mild disease or no disease whatsoever. 
but they still have so much virus in their nose and in their mouth that they can still spread it that way. And we think that like, you know, it's primarily these large droplets that are caused by sneezing and coughing. But also if you touch your mouth and you put that on a surface, other people can pick that up from that surface. And then also maybe a small fraction of all cases is because when we're um, talking even face to face and direct contact like that, you're producing like little spit particles that carry the virus. And that's another way that maybe um, people who are asymptomatic are spreading it. Oh yeah. I know, I know some people that spit a lot when they talk and I'm sure. Yeah, exactly. Right. (laughs) (laughs) I was kidding. But um, okay. So what about um, testing for this virus? So I know there's a couple different ways to test for this virus. One is by doing a nasal swab which you're actually testing for the actual RNA, and the other one is immune globulin. Can you talk a little about the difference between those two kinds of tests and and which one um, you think is going to kind of change the way this pandemic is handled? Mm, As far as I'm aware, I thought that they're all kind of testing for RNA. So the test is like you're testing for RNA by amplifying what you find there. So you break down the viral particle, and then you're left with RNA. And then there's amplification that occurs um, and that amplifies up that signal and you can detect that signal. But the thing with that is like, it's not positive or negative because there's background within that signal and there's a certain threshold that you have to reach for it to be considered like a valid result. Um, It's not just black and white with that. So, um, and the virus replicates in lots of different areas of the body. We think that the virus may even be shed in the feces and the urine. Right. And, you know, it moves from different areas of the body. So it might be present in the saliva early on, and it might be present in the throat early on. But if it moves, then you could get a false negative because it's moved down somewhere and it's no longer replicating there, but you're still infected. So where you take that sample from, is really important. And I think that we don't really know or we haven't tested regarding the duration of disease and the progression of disease, where that virus would be and where's the best place to take the sample from. Mm. Yeah, so there's so much about this virus we don't know yet. I know, it's very hard to answer questions and come up with you know perfect diagnostics and perfect vaccines. But I, I think the media though is you know talking about testing and it being the key and you know when you get a test you you know if you're not contagious anymore but they're only doing nasal swabs which have a high false negative rate just from sampling error itself and also like you said the other factors that maybe the virus moved maybe it's uh maybe the signal wasn't high enough on the test i didn't even realize that that there's a, a there's a certain threshold of signal you have to get to even on that pcr Test. So yeah, they call it a CT value. So that's the number of cycles you get to. And if you have a higher number of cycles, it means there's lower amount of input. So you can't you have to take longer, more cycles to rise above the threshold than if you get a lower number for a CT value. Um, and that would indicate that that's probably positive because there's more uh, RNA there initially. Right. So what do you think about the kind of what people are saying in the government about testing and how that's going to change the course of how this virus um, is dealt with? Well, I think testing would be great if we didn't have asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic transmission. The fact that we have those things is means that we're never going to be able to contain this virus by contact tracing. So contact tracing is when you test someone and if they test positive, you trace all their close contacts, right? But what if that person is asymptomatic and they never get tested anyway, or they have very mild disease and they can't differentiate what type of virus that is. It could be the cold, we don't know. So, and also we just don't have enough tests. So I think testing is very important, but if we don't have enough tests, it's not gonna do anything. Um, I don't know if you've heard of serology testing. Yes, yeah, that's the immune globulin antibody testing. Yes. So I think maybe that PCR testing is what we call it when we amplify the RNA, that in conjunction with serology testing would give us more information as a whole because the serology testing works on identifying antibodies against the virus. And antibodies develop um, relatively early during infection, but not as early as the infection itself. So, and they, they are durable for a long amount of time and they provide you 
with immunity, right? So if we can identify people who are immune, maybe that would help us going back to normal. So those people, so they should be protected so they can go back to their daily life. Is that what, That's what we hope anyway. Right. I know that's a hope, but then I hear a lot of uh, chatter about people getting reinfected potentially um, and uh, a resurgence of the infection. And also in the people that I'm seeing antibody profiles being done on, it's really variable how quickly they develop antibodies and how long those antibodies are taking to develop as well. So for example, right now we think that the, the antibodies start developing fairly early in the disease, but I'm seeing those early antibodies um, even a month after someone has symptoms or even mm -hmm. two months after symptoms. So I think there's still a lot we have to learn about the antibody production because right now the only studies I see on antibody production are the ones out of China and, you know, is it true that potentially even region to region, humans would develop antibodies differently at different times? Or do you think yeah, it's- I don't know about that, honestly. It could have to do with genetics and um, the robustness of someone's immune system. But right. um, the rule of thumb is that for other viruses, antibodies against the full virus will always be protective. Right. So all this chatter about the potential of these antibodies to not be protective I've kind of never seen that happen and I don't really believe that that would occur. I think that we don't know the durability of these antibodies because if the virus is changing or they just drop off over time, that's possible. But I don't think we're talking months. I think we're talking years. That's and real to hear from you. That's, that's very encouraging. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's kind of blown out of proportion a bit, you know? Right. Um, right. And the reinfection thing, I don't think reinfection is occurring. I think, it's possible in rare cases where people don't have an immune system that is functioning normally, but by far and large, reinfection wouldn't be occurring because we have those protective antibodies. I think the reinfection that people are seeing is actually a result of the test itself because as I mentioned, there's kind of that threshold of background, there's a limit of detection. And when the virus is replicating to very low levels, you're gonna have this peak and then it's gonna go below the threshold and it's going to be negative. Then you have a peak again, it's going to be positive, and then it's going to be negative. And that could happen for weeks, you know, until the, the body is actually able to clear the virus because it develops um, immunity. Wow. So I think all that people are initially, you know, they get a negative result and they come back and the virus is still replicating at low levels and then they think they're positive again. You know, this is the thing about medicine and science that has always intrigued me is that you, you hear so many like absolutes, like if it's negative, it's negative, it's positive, it's positive. Yeah. But everything is so nuanced. And unless you're a scientist and you really, really are working with this day in and day out like you are, it's, it's really hard for people to understand that nuances even exist, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know what happens in the lab, so many like, you know, differences and failures and right. uh, yeah, it's just... <laughs> When you have a news, you know, news outlets that are reporting on these things, they don't understand that it's not black and white. They don't understand that there's differences in reporting. Right, absolutely. It's, it's, it's so, they try to simplify it, and it's actually so much more complicated. Even I'm sure it's even more complicated than what you're telling me. And, you know, I'm a, science, I'm a, I'm a doctor, and I've been doing this for years, and um, you're dumbing it down to my level as well. And um, I'm sure it's just incredibly complex. And those, th just knowing that it's incredibly complex is knowledge, because, is, is powerful knowledge, because that way you don't make missteps and you don't, you don't do That's things true. incorrectly. When you simplify knowledge for people, it's easy to remove detail that is important for interpretation. Right. But I think, you know, these news outlets that are, I mean, they're kind of fear-mongering and they're kind of providing a lot of misinformation because of their misinterpretation of data. And they don't have the skills to look at that data and interpret that. They'll just see something and they're like, grab onto that. And like, i got to put that in a headline. Right. Right. Absolutely. It happens all the time. That's why I love doing these podcasts because I learn so much and I think our audience just learns so much more so they can, they're armed with the power of knowledge to really dissect what they're hearing. So that's, that's fantastic. Can, let's talk a little bit about vaccines because I'm really excited about what you're doing around vaccines. Can you just tell us in general how a vaccine to a virus works? Yep. So most vaccines are made of viruses themselves because the principle behind vaccinology is that a virus infects cells and it elicits an immune response 
Um, and that immune response is composed of many different parts. So there's one part of it that involves antibodies and these have specificity for the virus. So they will bind the virus. And when they bind the virus around all its different parts that bind cells, they prevent that virus from infecting cells. So vaccines, in some cases, they can prevent infection, but in most cases, they always prevent disease. Whereas a virus infection itself, it doesn't prevent, it doesn't prevent disease. I mean, it can provide you natural immunity to prevent disease in the long run, but viruses cause disease and vaccines do not. So we have those antibodies and we also have T cells, which are other immune cells that come in and they basically kill the virus and remove cells that are infected with the virus. And that's how you recover from a viral infection. Um, and then the key to immunity is that these cells have memory. So they can remember that antigen, which is the part of the virus that is exposed to the immune system. They can basically remember a pathogen. And then when they're re-exposed to that pathogen, the effect is very rapid. So instead of having to wait um, for infection, for those antibodies to develop and for T cells and immune cells to come in and clear the virus, it's already there. It's ready, it's waiting, it can attack and that's how it clears the virus and prevents infection and disease. So vaccines are just different formulations of a virus. So we wanna make sure that the vaccines don't cause disease. So usually the most crude vaccines are just killing the virus, taking a virus and killing it. Or having a virus that um, is very similar to the original virus, but doesn't cause disease because it's attenuated. So it's been passaged in some other animal and it no longer causes a disease in the human host. And then now we're working on like newer technologies, like we have um, subunits of vaccine, of viruses. So that's like taking the different proteins or different parts of that construct of the virus and formulating them. So we'll pick like for coronavirus, most of the vaccines are based on the spike protein because that's the one that binds um, cells. And that's the one that is exposed to the immune system. So that's what we call the primary antigen. And that's yeah the component of most of these vaccines against SARS-CoV-2. And then you have even like, you know, more experimental technologies that work on not only presenting that antigen to the immune system, but also um, bolstering that response by uh, enabling transcription, like reading and writing of the genome. So when the immune system sees that something is not right, that there seems to be RNA that is reading and writing itself, they're like, oh shit, that's a pathogen. So that enhances that, um, not only by presenting that spike protein, which the immune system can recognize as part of a pathogen, but also the replication of a virus itself. And it's basically saying, oh, well, there's replication going on of this foreign thing. And there's this like antigen that I can see here. And then when you provide them to the immune system, it will remember that. And that memory enables you to be protected. Wow, wow, that, that's, so basically a vaccine is still a virus, but it's just a virus that can't cause harm anymore. And yes. it just kind of, tricks or stimulates your immune system to make those antibodies so the next time the real virus comes in it's already ready to kill it right away so kind the whole of. purpose is to provide a protection from disease right right so you could always you know never have vaccines like we do right now for this one virus and then everyone has to suffer disease whereas we can essentially eradicate disease and spread of viruses by introducing a vaccine right so what, like, what if we never made vaccines? What if vaccines never existed in, in the course of human history? What, what, would, what would happen? Well, that's the thing is, so vaccine, well, viruses don't just kill people, right? Some right. of the very deadly viruses can kill majority of people they infect, but most viruses just cause disease. And disease is not fun. It takes away from the economy. We call it morbidity. So... Basically, you're sick, you can't go to work, and in rare cases, that damage that the virus causes is not just immediate. It can actually be lifelong. So I think a lot of people would be suffering from disability, and it's what we call sequelae. It's yeah. basically like, you know, it's, it's an ongoing damage. It's an ongoing effect that you've had from that infection. So right. there's lots of viruses throughout history that have caused sequelae, 
Um, and I think we would all be, you know, have pock marks all over, all over our faces. A lot of us would lose limbs. A lot of us wouldn't be able to walk. Um, that would have a huge effect on not only the health system, but just the way we live our lives. I think we wouldn't be able to make money. We wouldn't be able to work. And we might be living in a lot of poverty, like underdeveloped countries that sometimes don't have access to these, these, these vaccines and still have ongoing epidemics and um, outbreaks of infectious disease. And that's why I asked you that question, because, you know, I'm in Los Angeles. It's the land of anti-vaxxers over here and people oh, that are yeah. against vaccines. And I just don't think people understand how vaccines have changed the course of human history. And it's probably one of the only reasons that there's so many human beings on the planet right now and we have such great lives, um, kind of, you know, not in hospitals and not dying at young ages, et cetera. You know, mm -hmm. hospitals used to be pretty much the only reason that hospitals were around were to take care of people that were infected, mostly yeah. with bacteria and viruses, and mostly mm -hmm. viruses. And you know, this this has completely changed with vaccines to where now we can take care of more chronic medical conditions that weren't, people never even got there before with, with uh, infectious disease. Yeah, I think in our society, you know, in Australia and America, we're very removed from what infectious diseases are and how they can affect people. You know, in Brazil, in Africa, they still have to deal with that burden every single day. You know, like it's very common for people within their family to get infected if they don't get infected themselves. So, yeah, and I, I really believe that the development of vaccines is one of the best inventions humanity has ever come up with because we have saved potentially billions of lives, definitely millions. And, you know, vaccines actually, you know, we, we wouldn't have the population we have right now if not for vaccines, but vaccines actually prevent or limit population. And I know that sounds controversial, but it, think about it this way. So people in Africa, they used to have to have like 10 kids so that one would survive. Right. So you give them vaccines, now all of them survive. So, you know, they only have to have one or two kids now to further, you know, their family. And they don't right. have to have so many kids. Yeah, you're not playing, like you're not gambling with the number of kids you have. Just and that's not just in Africa, that was throughout all of human history, you know, even in our, in our cultures, everyone would have many, many kids just so one would survive because infectious disease would wipe out the rest. Right, right, it's so, so true, so, so true. And you know, um, when, whenever I think about vaccines and what it's done for humanity, it's just incredible. And to see people are out there now not getting their kids vaccinated, it's, it's pretty, it's mind boggling to me. And, you know, the conspiracy theorists out there say it can cause autism and, and other diseases. I mean, how do you answer those? Yeah, that's the one thing I want to basically cement in people's minds is that a vaccine doesn't cause disease. Sometimes you can have adverse effects because after all, it is a part of a virus. It is maybe an activated, a killed virus, or it can be just like a part of the virus. But those parts of the virus can be toxic because that virus itself is incredibly toxic. It causes a disease. But you have to think about it this way. Vaccines don't cause many adverse effects. They don't cause disease. Viruses cause a lot of disease. So we're preventing against this, right? We're preventing against that. So... <laughs> Right. It's just silly to me that you wouldn't want to prevent against that and you wouldn't want to protect yourself. And it's also not about just protecting yourself. Like I feel like in today's culture, we're so obsessed with, oh, I don't consent to this coming into my body. What about, oh, my cat. <laughs> <laughs> what about what is coming out of your body, you know? So I don't consent to getting what is coming out of your body. I don't consent right. to that. So... That's why we're social distancing. That's why we're trying to stay away from each other is because yeah. we need to change human behavior so the virus cannot spread. But right. it's not about what you're putting into your body. It's about what's coming out of it. And what's coming out of it can kill people. It yeah. will kill people. So you have a right to protect your community and those around you and your loved ones by getting vaccinated. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think you know, what you were saying earlier, vaccines don't just kill you. They cause debilitating disease that you viruses. have to live with. Uh, sorry, viruses don't, don't, viruses 
they don't always kill you, but they cause debilitating disease. I have a patient who um, whose daughter got the last flu. She wasn't vaccinated. She got the flu. She ended up in the ICU. And, you know, she's 20 something years old. And now she's on the list for a double lung transplant. So these kind of these kind of stories, you would hear them, you know, much more frequently if it weren't for vaccines. And this person now has to live, you know, basically a life where she's waiting for a lung transplant in order to stay alive because of the lack of getting vaccinated. And so these are these are the kind of stories I hear a lot of a lot of times when people don't get vaccinated. It's the consequences are devastating. And yeah. not just the health system, but the families, et cetera. So um, yeah, I, I appreciate you um talking about that. And well, that's the thing is that someone gave her that virus. Right. But it's not it's not really her fault that she wasn't vaccinated because she didn't give the virus to someone else, right? Well she could have, but it's right. not about you. It's about someone else so she she was given that virus by someone else that person is essentially responsible for her lung problems and that the fact that she needs new lungs yeah so i just i think we're so removed from what it is like to suffer from infectious disease like we diminish the severity of the flu the flu just doesn't cause moderate mild illness it is a, it is a spectrum of disease just like sars cov2 like covid19 you know like most people will never suffer from it, but the seasonal flu has a 0.1% mortality rate or even a bit lower than that. And right. it's like, you still have a risk of dying from it. Right. Even if you're young and healthy, the same way you have a risk of dying from SARS-CoV-2, even if it's relatively low, if you're young and healthy. Right. Right. Absolutely. It's the luck of the draw, I think, you know? Yeah, exactly. It's so true. So as far as vaccines go, why does it take so long to develop a vaccine? Is it a, is it, does, is a time in the laboratory the, the, the long period of time, or is it time studying the actual vaccine in people the, causing the length of time with vaccine development? It's everything. <laughs> so a lot of approval processes and paperwork you have to get through as well, and you can't speed those things up because if you speed those things up, then that person hasn't verified that your vaccine has, you know, um, achieved each stage and is ready. Uh, but I think that, you know, vaccines on average, they take like four, five to 10 years, even more because of that initial preclinical development. So the preclinical development is actually designing and developing the vaccine into what it's going to be when it gets into humans. So that involves designing it, um, putting it into cells, see if it grows, see if it has the correct antigens, and then testing whether those antigens actually elicit responses in um, terms of like antibodies. So you want to see that effect, you want to really characterize it and see what type of immune responses it's eliciting and see what those types of immune responses do to the virus. Do they um, completely protect the um, animal or whatever, the cells from reinfection? Um, do they clear the virus? Do they reduce the viral load? And I think the one thing is that you definitely can't speed up is the immune response because the immune response takes a long time. So if you're putting that into mice, if you're putting that into other animals, it's not like you just inject them, you wait, and then you see. It's like you inject them, you wait three weeks or four weeks, and then you inject them again just to see if that's going to improve it. And then you wait another three, four weeks, and then you harvest the sera and you uh, calculate how many antibodies are there. So that's the initial thing. And then you want to see if those antibodies actually protect against challenge. So challenge with the real virus. And then, yeah, you go through the same process again. That's already been, what, two months. Right. And then you got to do it again. And then you got to do it again and again and again. So <laughs> it's about waiting for that immune response to develop. And you have multiple experiments that can't really be done um, together in parallel. And then you have to look at toxicology, how safe is that vaccine in preclinical development. And you really can't move from each stage to the next until you've done it. So you start in cells and you just develop the vaccine, design the vaccine, put it in cells. And that may take a long time to even grow the vaccine. And then you do that, you show that it seems to work, and then you do mice. And then if you have a mice model, that's really good. For SARS-CoV-2, we don't. So we'll do another animal like ferrets. And then you have to show that it actually translates from what you see in the cells to what you see in an animal. Because an animal is very complex 
has lots of things going on, it has an immune system, you need to see that it works still. And then you go from that animal and you wanna go into like something that seems similar to a human, right? So you might do macaques, something like that. Mm. And then that takes another two months or another four months. And then you can, only then, once it's approved and it can go into clinical trials and shown to be safe, is that you progress through the clinical trials. Wow. So that's why it's gonna take 12 months minimum. And that's not even including the manufacturing process because right. manufacturing takes a long time too. Right, right. Yeah, it's, it's people, I, I don't think a, a lot of us, myself included, realize the amount of work that goes into developing a vaccine for this. And, and the amount of time. You're, dealing with, you're dealing with animals. So yeah. an immune response. So that's the limiting factor here. Is it's not just like, we have 100 people in the lab, let's do it all. It's like, no, you can only work with like one person in a hood and then there's a limit on the amount of work that you can actually do, even if you're working 24 seven. Sure, sure, exactly. And you can't speed up biology and immune reaction is gonna take its time. Yeah, it's not speed up biology. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> wow. So what do you think about some of these um, conspiracy theories? Now, is, it, is it possible for anyone to have made this virus in a laboratory in Wuhan? Like, is, yeah, is that- I don't think so. <laughs> I just think that all the stuff I do in the lab is like introducing one mutation and seeing how that affects the virus. Sometimes you introduce that mutation and the virus is non-viable. It doesn't grow, it's like, oh, dead. So yeah. <laughs> to actually think that we've made this virus from scratch with no evidence of, you know, using any other virus or anything like that. Like if I was to approach this from making this virus, I would be like, okay, I will use like the SARS, the original SARS backbone. And then I will like design using software, the most optimal way for this virus to spread and cause disease. This virus is like so not optimal. Like it has so many different mutations that could never be um, designed by a computer, that could mm -hmm. never be thought up essentially. And mm -hmm. we have no evidence that it's based on any other backbone and you know, it's very closely related to um, bat coronaviruses. So there's one called rat G13. So it's very closely related to that. And it just has no signs that would indicate that it's been engineered. And I think the ability to engineer something like that is just not where the technology is at. I don't even think we'll be at that stage for like 50 to 100 years, if not longer. I just think when you're manipulating something to that extent, it's not going to work in the way that you plan. And then there's, all, there's also like all those ethics and you know things that prevent that from happening in the first place. But yeah, like viruses are not actually that easy to manipulate. If you change something to a certain degree, it's just not gonna work. Yeah, so even if you're Bill Gates, you, you, you didn't invent this virus. <laughs> yeah, I just don't think the technology is there. Um, yeah, I think it's definitely, I would say it's not possible. Okay, and what about 5G making a virus? Oh, I don't know what to think about this. It's so stupid. <laughs> I hear that. I, I, it's just mind blowing to you even know, do those kinds of things. It's just science literacy. Like right. people that don't understand science, they understand a very superficial level of science and are like, oh yes. I don't know. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's I can't see the connection, right? It's like yeah. 5G is being rolled out in some places, but like the virus is everywhere. It's in nearly every country. And 5G is not in every country. Right, right, and absolutely. Like, and that's an important point. And it's, it's, it's not, you know, people confuse causality with association. So just because, yeah. you, you know, just because smoking causes cancer and you use a lighter to light up a cigarette to, to, to smoke it, doesn't mean lighters cause cancer. Just yeah. because two things happen at the same time in the same place doesn't mean they have anything to do with each other. So yeah. people don't get- conversation with a close like not a close friend but someone I used to know and they went on about 5G and like what is wrong with you like you're a smart person how can you possibly think that there's a connection here and they're like back to me it's like how can you possibly not see the connection I'm like oh my god I don't know like <laughs> crazy talk like it's just crazy and once you disprove well you educate them on viruses and vaccines and how they're made then they just like dismiss that completely and they go on about how 5G is actually killing people and the virus is not killing people. It's not that the 5G transmits the virus, it's like the 5G is actually killing people and it's like a cover-up. Like they just jump from one thing to the next. 
Yeah, I think some people just don't want to believe science and it's just it's mind boggling to me. But I want to believe that someone nefarious is out there and is like orchestrating everything and that it's not in their control. Yeah, I, I think the sad part about that is these are the same people that are not following the recommendations of the scientific community and they're the ones that are going to keep this virus going, moving yeah. forward, killing more people, unfortunately. And it's that's so sad because I think, you know, there are a lot of good science communicators out there, but oftentimes scientists, they don't want to like stoop to that level and they come off as quite pretentious. Like, mm -hmm. how can you be so stupid to not understand this? Like, no questions are stupid if you have no understanding. If right. You, to get, in order to get that knowledge, you have to ask stupid questions. Um, so we need science communicators that are more relatable and people, you know, they're providing information that people trust because when people trust the information that you're giving and it stays solid and doesn't change, then they're more likely to um, like take on these, um, the advice that you give. So I think right. we definitely have, you know, a pandemic of misinformation out there and it's not helping that like some governments and some organizations are giving information that changes from day to day and doesn't stay true because then people are like well you're not being transparent with us you're not giving us the full gist of everything how can we possibly trust you because if the public doesn't trust you they're not going to listen to your advice and you're not going to be able to implement biocontrol measures right Right, absolutely. It's, we have to be so careful of that. So switching gears a little bit, um, I want to talk about what you're doing in your lab because I found it extremely interesting. You're making a vaccine against multiple viruses using insect um, oh, DNA yeah. or host. Can you, can you give me a, a little bit of a simplification of what you're doing and how you're doing it? Yeah, so like I said, you know, Viruses are not just pathogens. They actually exist in nature in many different animals and they don't cause disease. So the viruses that I'm using for my vaccine, they only infect insects. So mm. we found them in Australia. It's one called Binjari virus. And essentially it does not infect mammalian cells. So it cannot replicate and it cannot cause disease in a mammal. It only infects insects. So what I did was, I didn't do this, but um, some of my colleagues, basically, they took that virus and they made a chimera out of it. So What's they, a, chimera? a chimera is like a mix of two things. Mm. So like there's a lot of chimeras in mythology, right? Like a bird and a dog or something like that mixed together. So I've got like an insect virus and then I've got a human pathogen mixed together, a human virus mixed together. And so the human component has the structure. It makes the structure of the virus and the internal component is basically the insect specific one. So all the things that the virus needs to replicate and perform its life cycle is insect specific. So it can't replicate in a mammalian host, but it looks exactly like the pathogenic human virus. Mm. So we, we like to use this metaphor. It's basically like, um, what is it? A sheep in wolf's clothing. Yeah. Or what, yeah. Yeah, so exactly. the wolf is the dangerous <laughs> part. Right. And then it really, it's not dangerous because it's a sheep. <laughs> Got it, so, got it. <laughs> yeah. What I'm doing is I'm looking at this structure and the reason I made like the wolf and the sheep's, the sheep and the wolf's clothing is because, you know, a lot of these viruses are very pathogenic and you need to work with them in high containment facilities because they cause severe disease. So like New York 99 West Nile virus that caused a big outbreak in New York in 1999. Right. And yeah, it can cause encephalitis, which is swelling of the brain. So I don't want to get infected with that. And it makes it very hard to work with those viruses when you're in all that gear. So we want to make them more accessible for people and we can work with them in my normal lab, essentially. And mm. then that virus itself works as a vaccine because it can't replicate, but it shows everything that looks like the pathogenic virus to the immune system. Does that make sense? It makes total sense. And so how can you get multiple viruses that are pathogenic onto one kind of molecule? It's not really like that. It's more like I'm trying to find the part of that structure that is the optimal antigen for a vaccine. Got so it. we call them epitopes. So epitopes are the parts of the antigen that the um, antibodies specifically bind to neutralize the virus and stop it from infecting cells. So you want to elicit antibodies that do exactly that. And what I'm doing is I'm looking at all the structures of all these different viruses that I've made. 
and seeing which parts of the structure are what we call cross-protective. So which parts are overlapping and the same between all these viruses. So if we incorporate that part of the, the virus that is the same into a vaccine, then we should have some antibody response that recognizes just that part. And then that part is cross-protective against all these different viruses. Wow. So yeah, we should have an immune response that recognizes not just West Nile virus, not just Japanese encephalitis virus, but all these viruses that have the potential to emerge and cause outbreaks. Amazing. And when do you think this virus will be ready for use? Or this uh, yeah. vaccine will be ready for use? Well, I don't know. Like, this is my whole project. My project goes for three to four years. Got it. So we'll start, like, 2024, 20, I should be graduated, and I hope that I'll have a vaccine wow. at some point development, whether that's going to be already in animal models. Like, I'm assuming it'll be in animal models, but whether it's going to be in, like, macaques already and have shown to be proved there, and whether it can proceed to human trials, I just don't know. Yeah. No. Yeah. So let me ask you, kind of in conclusion, what do you think the world is going to be like after coronavirus? What do you I think? I don't think there's an after. Yeah. To be honest, I think that what we say is that when a virus stays around, sticks around, it becomes endemic. So endemic means that, you know, there's a susceptible population that um, isn't immunized or doesn't have natural immunity and they can still spread the virus. So as long as there's, this, there's that susceptible population, there's the ability of the virus to stick around. And I think with vaccination, if you know immunity does drop off over time, there should still be some protection there. So we won't be able to prevent infection, but we might be able to prevent severe disease. So it's very likely that even with vaccination, this virus is gonna stick around. And mm -hmm. I think that it's not going to be severe anymore, though. It's going to be more like the other human coronaviruses because most people have some sort of immunity against it that protects against severe disease. So it's more likely that this coronavirus will become less severe over time and you know, just you know, elicit mild to moderate disease in severe cases. But you won't have everyone getting pneumonia and all these deaths that we're currently experiencing. So I think, yeah. After this pandemic is over, I think the virus might stick around. That's just my personal opinion. Yeah. And do you, like, why didn't we develop a vaccine to this when we had the chance with SARS, the first SARS that came around? What, what happened to the vaccine development process there? I think funding was cut. <laughs> so well, that, in addition to um, SARS and respiratory viruses, are quite difficult to develop vaccines against. Something about the mucosa, the lining of the lungs or wherever that virus is replicating, it's very hard to get a strong immune response that clears that virus out of there. And I think that with a couple of the vaccines that were in clinical trials, they saw some lung pathology in vaccinated individuals. So it didn't seem like it was um, perfectly safe and they needed to go back to the drawing board and try to fix that issue. But also at the same time, the SARS outbreak had diminished and no one was really dying anymore. So everyone was like, oh, we're fine. We don't need to vaccinate any, everyone with this vaccine that could potentially cause a couple side effects, right? Like the risk versus the vaccination was kind of like not as equivalent, you know? Yeah. Whereas like if that SARS virus was to reemerge, obviously the risk goes up a lot and then it's like worthwhile getting the vaccine even if there's potential for adverse effects. Sure, sure. Well, hopefully we learned our lesson this time and we finished this vaccine development, not let this thing come back again in the years. Or, yeah. You know. I really think it's important to just progress that. Like my project is specifically working on viruses that could emerge. Like they currently don't, some of them currently don't cause outbreaks. Like in some cases, I only have like one virus that's ever infected one person, but the potential is there. So we need to be prepared. Right, right. I think that's going to be key now, um, now that, you know, the world has lost trillions of dollars not being prepared for this one. I know, and it would only cost a few hundred million or whatever to have these vaccines available, many vaccines available. Right, right. We need to have an armamentarium of vaccines just in case any of these viruses come back like you're doing. So hopefully you'll get hundreds of millions of dollars of funding this time around, Morgan. And you get uh, to the project. So <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. I know it's early there in um, Australia. Yeah. And I, I woke you up early to do this. I really appreciate you 
getting on, on uh, Zoom with me and educating the public about viruses and all the education that you're doing on your Instagram page is fantastic. Keep Thank up you. the great work. <laughs> I'm trying. Thanks so much for giving me the opportunity to do this. I've never done anything like this before, so it's great. Yeah, thank you so much. It's excellent to have you, and I look forward to talking to you again in the future, Morgan. Take care of yourself. Have a good day.